with me when I say I believe the book of Colossians is the most profound book in the whole Bible. I also will go out on a limb and say this. It's the most relevant book to us today. More than Revelation, the book of Revelation, more than the book of Genesis, um, it's the book of Colossians. And the book of Colossians speaks to the overwhelming religious New Age teachings and heresies that are today. And I don't know what noise you got in it, Grayson, but it's got a noise in it, brother. And I'm telling you, if you had to pick one book, so let's ask people, if you had to pick one book out of the 66 books, what book, and all you could have was one book, you couldn't have any more, what book would you have? Who said Proverbs? <laughs> Who said Genesis? Cameraman, be quiet back there. Just run your camera. Everybody has their own favorite book, but I hope by the time I'm done, you would pick Colossians as well. So real quick, we're going to have to go real quick tonight because i got some place I want to end it on. So uh, Paul wrote... This book, for one primary reason, it was to address the heresies that are just widely known as Christianity today. But they had crept into this church who was a satellite mission church from the church at Ephesus. I don't think Paul ever went to Colossae. He writes the book as if he's never been there but yet, he's praying for them, and he feels like he's discipling them because they are a branch off of the church he started at Ephesus. But what had crept into that church, you can find in Acts 19 and 20, where Paul gives them a warning with tears that this is going to happen, and then in a few years it does. Uh, this, this town was in Turkey. It's very close within about 10 or 12 miles of Laodicea. And Laodicea uh, has a lot of things in common with it. They were sister cities. Laodicea is the last church spoken of in the book of Revelations. And Jesus said, I would that you were either cold or hot, but because you're lukewarm, I'm going to spew you out of my mouth. Now, all seven of the churches in Revelation chapter 2 and 3 were in a pretty small area in Turkey. There was a lot of churches in 95 AD when, when John wrote, but Jesus wrote letters to seven specific churches, and they follow church history, and they deal with seven different aspects of churches. And the last one, you know, is they think they're fat and happy and rich and they don't need God. And he says that you're uh, poor and he's on the outside knocking and he can't come in. And he makes it personal. If any man would open his door, he would come in. But he can't get in the church. And so that's the last day of church, the church of Laodicea. Well, the church at Colossa had... A lot of things similar. Now, what makes it cool about Laodicea is that phrase that he said about, I'd rather you be hot or cold, but because you're lukewarm, I'm going to spit you out of my mouth. That's what Laodicea means. Uh, it was known for lukewarm water. Because there was a city right above the city that had a hot springs, and it was boiling hot water. And they made an aquifer that would come down and supply Laodicea with water, and then from Laodicea it went on down to another city. But when the water got to Laodicea, it was lukewarm. So when Jesus says that, for those people in that day, they knew exactly what he was talking about. So keep that in the back of your mind. The church at Colossia, or the Colossians, 
has a lot in common with Laodicea. So, uh, it's filled with heresies. And it's about 100 miles east of Ephesus. It was full of Gnosticism. Gnosticism had infiltrated the church. Gnostic means to know. Gnosticism is uh, the people in the know. The Gnostics had these heresies that they taught. Mainly, Gnosticism attacks the deity of Jesus Christ. They have some other wild beliefs we don't have time for. Like they believe all matter is evil. Anything that's not spiritual is innately evil. Well, that's not true, but that's what they believe. But the, the heresy that they teach is that, God, that Jesus was not God. They attack the deity of Jesus. That's what's wrong with all the other Bible translations. It seems real funny, ain't it funny to you, that the NIV committee translates pretty much word for word with the old Alexandrian text till it gets to a verse about the deity of Jesus and then they deny or take that verse out. Why can they translate just pretty dead on verse after verse after verse and then when it comes to the deity of Christ, they water it down or they take the verse out or they deny it altogether? You need to ask yourself that. That's a problem. But remember, everybody's led by spirits. So, I was going somewhere, and then I lost, oh, I was going somewhere. This is where I was going. So <clears throat> there's a million different ways that religious systems deny the deity of Christ. For example, to deny that Jesus was God uh, is a heresy. But to put anything else on his level is the same as denying his supremacy as God. So you might say, well, the Catholics, they don't deny Jesus' deity, but in a way they do because they call Mary co-redemptive. So Mary's placed on the same level. Um, the Jehovah Witness, they deny that Jesus was God. But when you talk to them, it's hard to determine what they believe because they've been schooled. Now, most Baptists, they won't go to Sunday school no more. This church is an anomaly because we have great attendance in Sunday school. I wish it was better. But the Jehovah Witness, they go to school. And the Mormons, <laughs> they go to school. And, that, and they're trained to talk you out of your faith. So when you've been a good Southern Baptist and you ain't been to Sunday school in 14 years, because you're so low down and sorry and lazy and you don't know what you believe. You just got grandpa religion. Your grandpa was a Baptist and your daddy was a Baptist and you're a Baptist. When you meet up with a Mormon, you don't stand a chance. They've had countless thousands of hours of schooling and Jehovah Witness. And they're schooled and trained on how to take your Bible and talk you out of what you think you believe. They'll prove to you it ain't in there. And if you don't have the right Bible, guess what, bucko? It ain't in there. So I said all that to say this. <clears throat> Gnosticism believed a lot of different ways, but uh, most of them believed that Jesus was God, and it came on him. He was born a man, just a man, born in a manger, and his deity was given to him, and he was anointed Christ by God. So he was God, he was deity, he was made of God, much like a Pharaoh was made of God. Then when he went on the cross, the big father God took his deity away from him because he had to die as a man, because they can't wrap their brain around God dying. So he dies as a man, and then in order to be resurrected, the great father God puts deity back on him and resurrects him. That's Gnosticism. That's devilish. There's another form of it. <clears throat> Comes in a lot of different ways. Some of it is what I call Oprah Winfrey religion. 
and Oprah says that Jesus is great. Jesus is great. He is a path. He is a way to God. But he's not the way. He's not the only way. Uh, Jehovah's Witness believe that Jesus is not God, but he was God's way of salvation. He was God's design to come to earth and to die in place. He was God's son. A lot like the Mormons believe, Jesus was God's son. And Satan was God's son. And they both presented their plan to God the Father. And God chose Jesus' plan of redemption for the earth over the brother Satan's plan. Well, the brother Lucifer, in the Mormon teaching, got angry because he was jealous because the great father God chose his brother Jesus' plan, so he became Satan. And he grew horns, and he became God's adversary. But Jesus came, and it was his ideal to die for the sins of the earth, and the great father God accepted that plan. But Jesus wasn't God. He's just an exalted man, like you can be exalted as long as you just don't get a divorce and get baptized and wear your holy underwear and a list of other things. <laughs> That's a form of Gnosticism. So the whole witness believe Jesus was God's plan, but he wasn't God. There's only one God. Well, I believe that too. There's only one God. You better believe that. So, I said all that to say this. Went and got my mail. Went and got my mail Friday. I guess it was Friday. And I could see in my mail, I had this letter, and I could tell it wasn't a bill. It was from a human, you know, it was a letter. And I was like, well, I wonder what that is. And it was one of the long ones, you know. And so I pulled it out there, and the return address just said Paula. And I said, Paula? I don't know no Paula. Who's Paula? So I opened the letter up. And this is what it said, and it was handwritten, addressed to me personally. It wasn't a copied thing. Full page, and it said, Dear Sherman, she's a Jehovah Witness from Pahuska, and, they, and she said, Because of COVID pandemic and social distancing, we aren't going door to door anymore. So I'm sending you this letter. Have you ever thought about a world of peace and tranquility? Have you ever wondered about eternity? If you have any questions or you want to know more about Jehovah, please call. I would love to talk to you about Jehovah. And I was like, oh, my lads, the Jehovah Witnesses are so afraid of COVID that they can't even go door to door no more. They're sending out letters. It's a, what, what world are we living in? So, now you remember the Jehovah Witness taught that they were going to be the 144,000 witnesses in the book of Revelation. Well, that's a very, very dangerous, perilous time when those guys are going around preaching the gospel and these uh, Jehovah Witness from Pahuska are too afraid to even knock on your door. I don't think they qualify. But anyway, so this Gnosticism was all in the town of Colossae. So let's go. Colossians chapter 1, verse 1 and 2. We're going to go real fast because i got to show you something tonight. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God and Timotheus, our brother. To the saints and faithful brethren in Christ, which are at Colossae, grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Let me say this again. I always say it. Paul always addresses the letters he writes grace and peace never peace and grace because there is no peace until you experience the grace of God so grace comes first and then peace the question here in, in uh, verse 2 it says to the saints and the faithful brethren in Christ which are at Colossae would you consider yourself a saint are you a disciple? 
Well, let's just take a test real quick and see if you're a disciple. In John 8, verse 30 through 32, we're going to see tonight if you're a disciple, okay? As he spake these words, many believed on him, talking about Jesus. Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him. So the first criteria to be a disciple of Jesus Christ is you have to believe on Jesus, okay? Jesus said to those that believed on him, If ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed. So the question is, first, have you believed on Jesus Christ? Second, now listen, you can be born again. You can be what they call saved. I don't like the term and not be a disciple. You can be born of God's seed and not be a disciple. But you can't be a disciple and not be born again. So Jesus said to those that believed on him, if you continue, who changed it? That Grayson, he thinks he knows something. If you continue in my word. So there's a condition there. Now listen, we're not saying about being saved or born again. But if you don't continue in God's word, you're not a disciple. I don't care if you got it on your car or if you think you are, you're not. That's the qualification. Verse 32. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Now you hear that a lot, and people throw that around. You'll know the truth, and the truth will make you free. Not unless you qualify the if. The only way you're going to know the truth and the truth is going to set you free is if you continue in his word. Now, you don't continue in his word, you're not, you won't know the truth. You'll be just as a big a dumb dumb as anybody else. Just because you're born again don't mean you got downloaded the truth. You can be lied to and deceived just like anyone else. So it's the important thing is continuing in God's word. So back to Colossians chapter 1. We're going to be in verse 3. And we're going to look at our hope. We give thanks to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you. Since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus. Now see, there's a little hint. He didn't say anything about being with them or the last time he was there, he said he's heard about their faith. So since we've heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love which you have to all the saints, for the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, whereof you have heard before in the word of truth of the gospel. Now this hope is a lot of things. It's the hope we have of the second coming or the return of Jesus Christ. And primar primarily the return, the hope that's in the return is that the dead will be resurrected. That's the hope, okay? So verse 6, which is coming to you as it is in the world and bringeth forth fruit as it doth also in you since the day you heard of it and knew the grace of God in truth. Heard of what? The gospel. As you also learned of Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is for you a faithful minister of Christ, who also declared unto us your love in the Spirit. So this Epaphras had told Paul about their love, but I don't think Paul ever went there and met them uh, face to face. Look what it says here who also declared unto us your love in the Spirit. That word Spirit is the only time that word is found in this letter. Now listen. Don't get offended. Just get your big panties on and get it. There are churches and denominations and movements that have made such a big thing about the Spirit of God. They have conferences, and they pray for the move of the Spirit, and the Spirit this, and the Spirit that. You can't even talk to them about anything but the Spirit of God. Now listen, I, the Spirit of God is God's Spirit. And in this age, God deals with people 
through His Spirit. And if you're going to know God, you're going to know Him in spirit and in truth. But you've got to understand what the Spirit does. The most important thing in God's plan and movement is not to get a bunch of people to lay on the floor. The most important thing in a church service is the moving of the Holy Spirit in the lives and the hearts of people to convict them to salvation and to confront them and to comfort them and to grow them in the Spirit of the Lord. But the Spirit's not elevated. Jesus is. The most important thing in a church service is never that someone would blibber-blabber in a, in a gibberish that no one knows. Kawasaki, Yamaha, should have bought a Honda. That, that is not the overwhelming plan of God. Now, if it was, why does Paul, you said in this church, and we went, you didn't notice what was happening probably, but we went through the Gospels and then we went right into the book of Acts. The book of Acts took us a year and a half. And we left the book of Acts, we went to Romans. In the book of Acts, there's about three mentionings of tongues. Most of them are derogatory for them. We went right into the book of Romans. There's not one mention of tongues. Now, if tongues are the most important thing, and you're not saved unless you speak in tongues, why does Paul write what some claim to be the greatest passage of literature, the book of Romans? There's not one mentioned. We left the book of Romans. We went to where? 1 Corinthians. The book of 1 Corinthians has a chapter dealing with the heresy of tongues, and it has a mention of it in another place. That's it. The second chapter, uh, uh, the second book of Corinthians, I don't believe ever even mentions it. We left there, we went to what? Galatians. Not one mention. Does that not surprise you? We left there, we went to Ephesians. Not one mention. Not one mention of being slain in the Spirit. Not one mention in any of those books about barking like a dog under the power of the Holy Spirit or quacking like a duck or uh, crowing like a rooster or shaking uncontrollably or flopping and rolling up and down like uh, stop, drop, and roll like you're on fire. Not one mention of a fire tunnel. Not one mention of being drunk in the Holy Spirit. Not one mention of smoking the ghost, as Bethel Church says. Well, now you're in this book. I think it's the greatest book in the whole Bible. That's the only time the word's in the whole book. Let me show you why. It's a biblical truth. Look at John 16, 13. John 16, 13, Jesus Christ speaking. How be it when he, the spirit of truth, so the spirit is a he. Now, if you was silly enough to watch that movie, The Shack, or read the book, they portrayed the Holy Spirit as a big, fat, black and Jemima. A big, fat, overweight, obese, I can say that because I... I seen her at the old beast club every Friday, Friday night. And Jemima, black woman. And a number one seller. To who? To people that claim to be born again. They want to read a book about a guy who lost his daughter in this makeshift, make believe jibber-jabbers, and they won't open their Bible to save their life, and then they wonder why they're a bunch of dum-dums. Well, let me tell you something. Whether you like it, lump it, dump it, thump it, I don't care. The Holy Spirit is not a big, black, overweight, Aunt Jemima, 
uh, off of a syrup bottle woman. The Holy Spirit is the Spirit of God. It's not, a, it's not another God. It's not a force doing God's bidding. It's God's Spirit. How be it when he, Jesus says, the Spirit of truth has come, he will guide you into all truth. Well, everybody's guided by spirits. They're either led or inspired or guided. Evil spirits, God's spirit, your spirit, it doesn't matter. He will guide you in all truth, for he shall not speak of himself. He never speaks of himself. The Spirit of God never leads someone to dwell on himself. Now, you may have to teach uh, the spiritual truth or biblical truth about the Holy Spirit. That's not what we're talking about. Jesus is saying, I'm going to go away, and the Spirit's going to be here dealing with you, but he's going to point you to me. And if you get some spirit that keeps pointing you to itself, it ain't my spirit. Watch it. He shall not speak of himself. But whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. Well, he wants to lead you and to guide you and to inspire you. That's what he does. And he'll show you things. He'll keep you up at night. He'll come up beside your head and you're not even ready for it and say, look at here. But he won't say, look at me. Hmm. So, that's what Jesus said. I, I didn't say it. So back to Colossians. Colossians 1, 9, 14. We're doing good. We're doing good. Well, you're going to go somewhere tonight. Hang on. For this cause, we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you. So we heard about you coming to the gospel and your love for the saints. And, and Paul said, I put you on my prayer list. We do not cease to pray for you and to desire that you might be filled with the knowledge of his will. Now, he keeps bringing up this word knowledge because the Gnostics are the knowers. They claim to have knowledge that normal people didn't. He said, we're praying that you might be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding, not Gnosticism that you might walk worthy of the Lord and the all-pleasing, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. So what he's going to lay out is the doctrinal truth of the knowledge of God. <laughs> Watch it. Strengthen with all might according to his glorious power and to all patience and long-suffering with joyfulness. He's just setting them up for the coup de grace, is all he's doing. Twelve, giving thanks unto the Father, which has made us meet or perfectly fitted to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son. Watch it. In whom we have redemption... Through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. That is your first doctrinal truth, really, in the book of Colossians. And it's in the face of the Gnostics. They didn't believe Jesus' blood was any different. And Paul is setting his argument that this is the wisdom and the knowledge of God that it was through the blood of Jesus we have redemption. Now, I harp on this, but I harp on it for a reason. The vast majority of Christian people could not tell you the difference in redemption and remission or redemption and forgiveness. And the reason why I harp on it is because I went for years and didn't know the difference. I thought they meant the same thing. I don't think you're silly if you do, because I did for years. And when I understood, when I was taught, 
when the Holy Spirit led me, I, my eyes got open. And I thought, oh, this unlocks the whole Bible. So there's a difference about being forgiven than being redeemed. They both start with an R. They're both in the Bible, so it's what I call Christianese. People just read the Bible and they just say Bible words like, you know, redemption and remission and propitiation. And I'm pretty soon it's just, blah, blah, blah. it's just all Christianese. But these words mean different things. They're spelt different. They're totally two different things. So I've used this analogy. Let me use it real fast. If I borrowed $100 off of Rocky and I said, I will pay you back $150 Friday. And it got to Friday and I didn't have it. And I went to Rocky and I said, hey, Rocky, uh, David J. didn't pay me what he owed me, so I can't pay you what I owe you. Could you give me till next Friday? And I'll go break David J.'s legs and get my money. And if Rocky wanted to forgive that note and push out the due date or the judgment day till next Friday, he could forgive it for the next week. But I still owed him. It still hung over my head. Rocky did not redeem the note. He didn't wipe it away like it didn't exist. He just said, okay, I'll remit your payment until next Friday. That's remission. I'll forgive it for now. But don't you forget, fat man, you still owe me. That's the way Rocky talks to me. Now, if I owed him $150, and I needed to pay him on Friday, and Friday was the due day. And Joshua said, don't worry about it, I'll go pay him. And Joshua went to Rocky and said, here's Sherman's $150. Then Rocky wouldn't have to forgive me my note, it was redeemed. And it was paid in full, and it was erased as if I never owed Rocky a penny because redemption was made by someone else. So forgiveness happened all through the Old Testament before the blood of Jesus was shed. But when the blood of Jesus was shed, the blood of goats and of ox and of turtle doves, all they did was put it off for another week. But those sins still hung over those people's heads. Their sin was not redeemed. It was not paid for. It was not cleared. They still owed a debt. But it was put off, and God's judgment was appeased for a while. <laughs> okay? So here we go. In whom we have redemption, so all you Gnostics listen up, through the blood of Jesus. Ah, well, he's starting to make his case, ain't he? Well, let's show you what a group of Gnostics, knowers, did to the NIV Bible. This is maybe one of the top five verses in the whole Bible if you're going to understand what you go around flapping about being saved and most people don't even understand what it means. They, they talk about being born again. They got no clue. This verse is an essential verse. Look at the NIV Bible. In Colossians 1.14 it says, In whom we have redemption... The forgiveness of sin. Do you see now why people have a confusion that redemption and forgiveness is the same thing? If you just read that on the surface, in whom we have redemption, comma, the forgiveness of sin. But they left out the most important part of the whole book of Colossians. It's through his blood. Now you say, well, ah, that's just bloody. I don't like to hear. Get rid, get, grow up. It's the Rosetta Stone that unlocks the whole redemptive process. And you start, you get a little bit here and a little bit there, and then you figure out, well, why did I need redeem to start with? Because of your blood. But the vast majority of Christian people 
who carry around an NIV, and I'm just picking on the NIV because we have it on that computer. I could have pulled you up anything else, ASV, RSV, Message, Living, Bible, it don't matter. They've all took it out. Listen, it's essential for you to know it's gone. You don't have it. You don't know. It's one of those verses the Jehovah's Witness love because the Jehovah's Witness have a Bible that's called a Watchtower Bible, and the Jehovah's Witness are the biggest uh, preachers against Catholicism on the planet, but they took their Bible from the Catholics. And so, guess what? Their Bible has that same verse. And you sit there as a little Baptist, and you say, uh, no, I'm saved by the blood of Jesus. And they'll, and they'll look at your house, and they'll see that you got an NIV sitting there, and they can barely make out NIV because it's got four inches of dust on it, and they'll say, would you like to show me that? And you say, yeah, because you heard Grandma talk about it. You say, yeah, give me a minute. I'll show you. You sit down. I'm going to show you, Joe Witness. And you'll be flopping in there about 30 minutes, and then you'll finally say, well, I know it's in there. My grandma said, I just can't find it right now. And they'll look at you with such love and charity, and they'll say, no, friend, no, my friend. You've been lied to. It ain't in there. Well, that ought to make you fuming mad. It's left out. The only way you're redeemed is by his blood. The most important truth to understand how you are redeemed, not forgiven. Also, why you're redeemed. Your blood is bad. Your blood is corrupt. Why do we need redeemed? Because our blood is corrupt. Redemption is not forgiveness. And remission or forgiveness is not redemption. Sins were forgiven in the Old Testament without redemption. Look at Hebrews chapter 9. We're going to go somewhere. Hang on. Hebrews chapter 9 verse 11. Watch this. But Christ being come a high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle not made with hands. Ah. Let me read that again. Now remember, this book's written to Hebrew people. Hebrew people that need to come to a saving knowledge of Jesus through the blood of Jesus Christ and forget about the blood of sheep and goats. They're Hebrew people. They're Hebrew people. They got to get out of the law and get to a believing on Jesus by faith. And that's why Paul or whoever else who wrote it there are some people that don't think he wrote it. We call those people weirdos. That's what the book's about. Watch. But Christ being come a high priest, you think a Hebrew knows about a high priest? Yeah, yeah. So Christ being come a high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle. What was a tabernacle? That's what the Hebrews knew. Moses built a tabernacle. It was a mobile tabernacle house of God well Jesus become a greater mobile house of God and gave you the power to become the temple of God and we're not looking for a temple in Israel and we're not looking for Jared Kushner to come through and build us one we are one and if you're going to desecrate the temple of God it ain't got anything to do about some building on the temple mount in Israel you desecrate this temple. And how do you desecrate this temple? What was his name, Josh? Antioch. Uh, how did he desecrate the temple? He put a non-kosher hog's blood on the altar of God, on the mercy seat. He put a corrupt blood on the place where God's blood was to be put. So how are you going to desecrate this temple? By corrupting your blood. The desecration, the abomination of desecration 
is when you change this blood pumping in your veins from a human into something else. And if you ain't got that figured out, you don't have much figured out. Don't worry about the Antichrist going into a temple that ain't built and won't be built in your lifetime and somehow sitting on the, um, the altar, uh, the Ark of the Covenant, and desecrating the temple that Jared Kushner's going to build. The abomination of desecration is the human beings desecrating their temple and changing their blood from human Adamic genealogy into something else. <laughs> I wish I had six hours. But Christ being come a high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, he entered into once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. He put his blood someplace. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctify to the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. If the blood of a bull and goat could do it, how much more is Christ's blood's precious? Watch this. And for this cause, he is the mediator of the New Testament, that by means of death, he had to die for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the First Testament. The redemption. He had to die for the redeeming of the Old Testament saints who were under the First Testament. Did you get that? I know it's kind of wordy and hard to understand because we're not Hebrews, we're Cherokees. Watch it again. And for this cause, he is the mediator of the New Testament, that by means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the First Testament. So he had to die for the transgressions that was under the Old Testament or the First Testament believers. Okay? People don't think about that. They which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. For where a testament is, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. Haven't you heard of a will and testament? My good friend Tony, he looked death right in the face. I about called him one day and said, hey, do you have enough, do you have enough strength in your hand to, write, to pencil me in your will and testament? What do you think testament means? Oh, I just thought it was the first half of the Bible and the second half. No, they're testaments. They're covenants. They're wills. Watch it. For a testament is of force after men are dead. Now, I have never, ever, it's, it's called the Jacob's curse. I have never, ever, ever had a person in my family die and leave me anything except I have had to bury four people with, out of my bank account. With, and they had kids standing around and they wouldn't bury them. The only thing I've ever got is the bill. But some of you is not that way, and that's why we sometimes look at you. <laughs> some of you has been left all kinds of things. But the will and testament ain't in force until Grandpa kicks the bucket. I mean, you can know that you're going to get it, 
but you don't get it till he dies. So there's by needs means the death of the testator because the transgressions and the sins of the saints in the Old Testament could not be redeemed until Jesus died. And that's why I teach that goofy thing that when he went down into Abraham's bosom in, in 1 Peter chapter 4, he preached to them the gospel. Why? Because they had to believe on Jesus just as well as you in order to be born again. Because why? Because no man comes to the Father except through him. Well, Moses was a man, Abraham was a man, Adam was a man, and he couldn't get there no easier than you could have. These verses are telling you, for a testament is a force after men are dead. Otherwise, it is of no strength at all while the testator liveth. So Jesus died for the redemption, not for just those that came after the cross, but for those that came before the cross. Look at Exodus 34, 7. Exodus 34, 7. I got to hurry. I'm going to take you there. I'm going. Keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquities, that's just sins, and transgressions and sins, and that will by no means clear the guilty. So this, this system that God set up in Exodus would in no way clear the guilty, but it would forgive them for a period of time. But they weren't cleared. They weren't cleared until Jesus rose from the dead. So the blood of Jesus not only bought the remission of sin or forgiveness, it also brought complete redemption. Look at Romans 3.25. Romans 3.25 real fast. Whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. He's the propitiation or payment in full. Look at Matthew 26, 28. Here we go. For this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission or forgiveness of sin. Now Acts 20, 28. <clears throat> Acts 20, 28. Take heed therefore unto yourself and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost has made you overseers to, to feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood, the blood of God. The blood of God was the blood in Jesus' veins because Jesus was God. Acts 1, 7. Acts 1, 7. And he said unto them, Is it not for you to know the times or the seasons? which are the Father hath put in his own power. So now, you should be totally upset that you have in your house Bibles by the score that took that out of the blood through the blood of Jesus Christ because that's vitally important to the redemption plan. Let me show you another case. Go, this is, this is one of my favorite stories. Ezekiel chapter 8. Ezekiel chapter 8. I just love the way this unfolds. We want to go Ezekiel chapter 8, verse 3 through uh, 17, I think it is. Did you have time to get that, Grayson? You speaking in tongues? What did you say? Ezekiel 8, 3. Now, check this out. How would you like for God the Father to grab you by the head of hair, by the locks of your head? Well, I'd like to see him try, right? I mean, I don't have any. But he'd grab you by the ears or something, right? Watch what Ezekiel says in this chapter. It's one of the most craziest chapters. You never hear anybody say anything about it, but watch this. And he put forth the form of a hand, and he took me by a lock of mine head. And the Spirit lifted me up between the earth and the heaven and brought me into the visions of God to Jerusalem, to the door of the inner gate that looked toward the north, 
where was the seat of the image of jealousy which provoked to jealousy. Now let me set the stage here. Israel has went back to pagan gods like they always did. But they kept the facade so they could get the offerings up in the temple. But underneath in the basement, they were worshiping the devil. They weren't confused. They weren't a little backslid. They were worshiping the devil. And so God sees everything. So God takes Ezekiel by the hair of the head, and in a vision, he takes him into the basement underneath the temple, underneath the door and the altar, to see what they were doing in secret. So they thought they were in secret and no one would know. So up on the surface, they're the priests and they're doing all their stuff and they're still collecting their offerings. But under the basement, they're worshiping the devil. Okay? Let's see if we relate to it. So they had set up this image. Verse 4. And behold, the glory of the God of Israel was there according to the vision that I saw in the plain. Verse 5. Then said he unto me, Son of man. Now, I like this scripture because I can relate to God. And the Holy Spirit writes it to where you can feel the heart of God. He's hurt. He's frustrated. He's angered. And, and it's, I know you've had situations like that. You've been over backwards to help somebody. You've helped them and helped them and helped them. And all they've done is turned on you. You can feel it in the way the Holy Spirit writes it. Watch this. Then he said unto me, Son of man, lift up thine eyes now the way toward the north. So I lifted up mine eyes the way toward the north, and behold, northward at the gate of the altar, this image of jealousy in the entry. He said furthermore unto me, Son of man, seest thou what they do? He said, Do you see what they're doing? Watch. Even the great abominations that the house of Israel committeth here, that I should go far off from my sanctuary. They've polluted my house. They want to drive me from my sanctuary. Watch. But turn thee yet again, and thou shalt see greater abominations. He, he said, we're not done yet. Look at what else they're doing. Verse 7. And he brought me to the door of the court, and when I looked, behold, a hole in the wall. So God in this vision wipes away this hole so he can see what they're doing in the basement. Then said he unto me, Son of man, dig now in the wall. And when I had digged in the wall, behold, a door. And he said unto me, Go in, and behold, look, behold the wicked abominations that they do here. So I went in and saw, and behold, every form of creeping things, an abominable beast, and all the idols of the house of Israel portrayed upon the wall round about. So in this room, they had drawn pictures of every creeping thing, like snakes and scorpions and lizards and, and every abominable thing that the pagans worship, and they had put them around the walls of this room underneath in the basement of God's temple. And you say, well, there's just pictures or just idols and things. God says it's abominable. Watch. And there stood before them 70 men of the ancients of the house of Israel. Now, <laughs> hold on there. Now, I don't know what you think that means, but if you believe that for as it's written, it seems to say... <laughs> that under this dungeon in this holy place they had made to worship the devil, there were some really, really, really old guys. Now remember, in Genesis 6, 
They got to messing with the blood of humans. They were giants, but they also lived a long, 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 long time. And then another time, the only other time that we know that God wiped out a group of people was Sodom and Gomorrah, and the scripture says they were men of old. And the scripture says when God came to Abraham that the cries of that city had came up before God. And if you do a search in the Hebrew, it gives you the ideal that the cries were coming from the little ones. And if you know anything about history, for the 6,000 years that we know of, mankind through paganism has always taken the blood of infants and used it for them to live better and longer. And if you think that God wiped out Sodom and Gomorrah just because they were a bunch of queers, you've missed it. Now, they were homosexuals. They were, but they were men of old. They were messing with their blood and living long, long time. What do you have today? They're messing with your blood to try to get you to live longer. Hey, listen, if you got enough money, you can have a blood transfusion of what they call young blood right now in many, city, many cities in the United States. And that's just blood taken from teenagers that their parents will allow them. But the real rich people gets infant blood. You say, here he goes again. He's lost his mind. Whatever. Watch it. Now, you can believe it if you want to, but at least you can read, can't you? About fifth grade le reading here. And there stood before them 70 men of the ancients of the house of Israel. And in the midst of them stood, he gives their names. Jezani, the son of Shaphan. I don't have a clue who that is. With every man his censer in his hand. Oh, Lord, if you ever show up here. And, and I got a censer in my hand, just turn around and walk out. I used to have, well, I still got a friend, my friend Bobby Walker, you guys all know him. Before my boys would go to a big wrestling tournament, he'd say, you want me to come over and fan them boys off? I'd say, Bobby, if I see you on my porch, I'm going to shoot you. What he's talking about, he'd bring a cedar branch, and he'd light that cedar branch, and he'd take eagle feathers, and he'd fan that smoke on my boys to ward off the evil spirits. I said, don't you bring that eagle feather and that smoke around my boys. They had a censer in their hand. They're burning incense. And a thick cloud of incense went up. You think God received that? Then said he unto me, Son of man, hast thou seen what the ancients of the house of Israel do in the dark. Who's these ancients of the house of Israel? These are really old dudes. But they're doing things in the dark. But God sees every man in his chamber of his imagery. Well, they got pictures in their minds of the pictures they had on the wall, don't they? They're taking it home with them. For they say, the Lord seeth us not. The Lord hath forsaken the earth. He said un, also unto me, Turn thee yet again, and thou shalt see greater abominations that they do. Greater than this? Then he brought me to the door of the gate of the Lord's house, which was toward the north, and behold, there, were, there sat women weeping for Tamuz. Now, Tamuz was Nimrod's son, supposedly the reincarnation of Nimrod. When Nimrod was killed, he was cut up into 14 pieces. They found 13 of them, but the one piece they couldn't find was the piece needed to have a baby. So they made that piece out of gold, and his wife, Semiramis, she wound up pregnant. So she came up with this story that the baby she was pregnant with was impregnated by the dead body of Nimrod and that extra piece that they had made out of gold 
and he was the reincarnation of Nimrod. That baby's name was Tamuz. He's called a many a different things. He's called Apollo. He's called all kinds of different things throughout Greek mythology and history. But the Israelites had started worshiping the pagan ways, and they would take a branch and stick it up to their nose and breathe in the air, and it was a pagan belief that the evergreen trees would purify the air they were breathing. And the Israeli women are weeping for Tamas. Look at verse 15. Then said he unto me, Hast thou seen this, O son of man? Turn thee yet again, and thou shalt see greater abominations than these. And he brought me into the inner court of the Lord's house, and behold, at the door of the temple of the Lord, at the door of the temple of the Lord, between the porch and the altar, were about five and twenty men, with their backs toward the temple of the Lord, and their faces toward the east, like good masons. They always worship the east, because the east is where the sun rises. It don't matter what Masonic temple you go to. The altar is always in the east. They always go to the east. It doesn't matter. If the building they bought was already there, they rearrange the insides and where the altar is in the east. In the Bible, you always go west to find God. So they had their back toward the temple of the Lord and their faces toward the east, and they worshiped the sun toward the east. It's all sun worship. Then he said unto me, Hast thou seen this, O son of man? Is it a light thing to the house of Judah that they commit the abominations which they have committed here? For they have filled the land with violence and have returned to provoke me to anger. And lo, it, it, above all that, they put the branch to their nose. He's just beside himself. And you say, well, what's the big deal? Is this an evergreen branch or you stick up to their nose like an idiot? It's an abomination to God. Why would that be such an abomination to God? Because the Spirit of God is the air. And God knelt down. He made Adam out of the ground, and he breathed in him the air of life in his nostrils. And the word spirit just means air. Mm -hmm. So instead of thanking God for the air they were breathing, it's guys like Tony, they appreciate every breath, don't you, Tony? You don't think about it if that doesn't happen to you, if your breath hasn't been robbed from you. You're just breathing. But they was using an evergreen tree to purify their spirit. It's what they believed. But it all starts from these imagery from these things, these aids of worship that they had around this secret place. Let me show you what they did. So, this wasn't anything new. <clears throat> they did it in Canaan land, in the book of Numbers. Go to Numbers. This is my last scripture. You can hold on. And the Lord spake unto Moses in the plains of Moab by Jordan near Jericho, saying, God tells Moses, 51, Speak unto the children of Israel and say unto them, When you are passed over Jordan into the land of Canaan. So he says, Look, when you cross that Jordan, we're going to go in there whooping and stomping, and we're going to kill them all, and we're going to run them out of my land. But you got to listen. Here's what's going to happen. Then you shall drive out all the inhabitants of the land from before you and destroy all their pitchers. Their pitchers? Wasn't that something that silly, ain't it? No, they had aids to worship. God hates it. They had pitchers. Watch. I'm going to take you somewhere you ain't never been. He said, destroy all their pictures and destroy all their molten images. That would have been anything that they melted down and made to worship and 
quite plucked down all their high places, all their uh, evergreen trees. Now, you're going to miss it if you have a king, if you have an NIV Bible, look at this verse. Numbers 33, 52. Watch what they left out. Drive out all the inhabitants of the land before you. Destroy all their carved images and their cast idols. And demolish all their high places. There's never been found a Hebrew text that left out, destroy their pictures. Yet you've only got one Bible <laughs> that leaves it in there. As a matter of fact, there wasn't any mention of carved things, just molten idols. Now listen, if you didn't know, you read that verse, Sounds real Christian, don't it? God said when you go in there, tear up their carved idols and their molten idols. But you miss the reference to pictures and imagery. And you wouldn't have known to tie it to Ezekiel chapter 8 where they use pictures and imagery. If you're not real careful, you wouldn't guard yourself against pictures and imagery that want to come in to your mind. And if you're not real careful, you'll be sitting in a recliner watching pictures after picture after picture. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the great book of Colossians. Thank you for your spirit that always points us to Jesus and the work on the cross and the redemption power of his blood and the resurrection power of the resurrection of Jesus Christ is our hope. And when he comes back, resurrection is with him that we might be resurrected from death unto life. God, thank you. Help us in the week to come that we be a witness for you that we love your word, that we begin to study your word with a fervent that we've never had before, that we might unlock the truths that are there within. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.